And now I am pleased to turn, turn things over to uh, Nina Totenberg, NPR's legendary legal affairs correspondent, who will moderate a discussion with our second panel of experts and distinguished guests on the current state of indigent defense in this country. So please join me in welcoming former uh, Chief Justice Sue Bell Cobb of the Alabama Supreme Court, Director... Director William Leahy of the New York State Office of Indigent Legal Services. And the legendary Executive Director Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative. And Ms. Totenberg. You know what legendary means? Old. Uh, I'm really very honored to be hosting this panel. Um, Sue Bell, you grab that one. And you should, do you guys have two? Yeah, you do. Uh, so Gideon versus Wainwright was one of those triumphs of good, right, justice, it was the system working the way that it should. It was the fulfillment of the democratic ideal of fairness for the least of us. Anyone who watches Law and Order on television sees this played out almost any night of the week on any cable channel. With even the poor lawyering up with lots and lots of protections. But it turns out that in reality, Gideon in the modern world is quietly and slowly turning to ashes. I confess to you that I, who covered the Supreme Court, and supposedly anyway, all things legal, didn't fully appreciate that until really a couple of nights ago when I sat down to prepare for this panel. I had not realized, for instance, that demand for lawyers for the indigent and ability to pay for them has simply outpaced the supply at enormous levels, or at, at least meaningly, meaningful supply. When Gideon was decided 50 years ago, there were a quarter million people behind bars nationwide. Now there are 2.3 million people behind bars. And about a million of those are sitting in jail having not been convicted of anything yet, or sentenced to any time at all yet. After Gideon was decided, Florida set up a system of public defenders in the state, and, and Miami became the model, both in the state and for a lot of the rest of the country. Well, today, public defenders in Miami have a caseload of 500 felonies a year, more than three times the number that the American Bar Association says should be the maximum that any public defender has. And the situation elsewhere is even worse. As I read up for this panel, I, I have to tell you that I was, I was actually shocked at the stories of, of people languishing in prison for weeks and months prior to trial without any lawyer. I suspect that some of us have been lulled into complacency by the fact that we live in large urban areas that tend to, although not always, do a slightly better job because there are more organized public defenders as opposed to in rural areas. Uh, but for the, the estimated 80% of, cr of criminal docket defendants who have appointed counsel in most places, it's not meaningful counsel. And there are some very famous stories. Uh, the capital defendant whose lawyer fell asleep during trial, but whose conviction was upheld anyway. The Texas murder defendant who sat in jail for eight months before he was appointed an attorney. The Mississippi woman who spent almost a year in jail on a shoplifting charge before a lawyer was finally appointed to defend her and she got out. And for every one of these you can mention, there are probably hundreds if not thousands more. So today, the Justice Department and the inimitable Deborah Leff have put together this panel to highlight the problem and at least discuss some potential solutions. And my job is basically to make sure that we finish on time. 
Um, so let me very briefly tell you just a tiny bit about my panelists here. Sue Bell Cobb became one of Alabama's youngest trial court judges in 1981. She was the first woman elected to the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals and in 2007 became the first female Chief Justice of the state, retiring in 2011. Uh, William Leahy led the Massachusetts Public Defender Agency for 19 years and in 2011 became director of the New York State Office of Indigent Legal Services. Brian Stevenson, about whom you've heard already too much, uh, is founder of the Equal Justice Initiative in Alabama. He's championed the cause of the poor, especially in capital cases and in cases involving life terms taking these cases all the way to the United States Supreme Court and often, but not always, winning. So let me begin by asking each one of you to give us a couple of examples that illustrate the problem that the country is facing. And after that, we can mix it up a bit, and I'll recede into the background. But first, uh, Chief Justice Cobb, let me start with you. What sorts of incompetent counsel have you seen as a trial and appellate court judge? You know, once again, I want to thank the Attorney General for, as a prosecutor, putting an emphasis on this because I do think that's part of the key for change. Um, I wish it, I could say it was just anecdotes. I wish I could say it's exceptions that prove the rule. But unfortunately, this ineffective assistance is pervasive and it's happening every day, everywhere, and not just in Alabama. Two examples. As Chief Justice of a unified system, I received an anonymous letter, I'm so sad it was anonymous, of a well-educated woman whose niece was charged with a Class C, one to ten years in Alabama offense. The first thing her, if she was indigent, the first thing her appointed counsel said was, I can get you three years probation. Not, what, did you, what is your name, what did you do, or anything else. As a result, she refused. They, he, she, he did everything he could to press her into a plea. She went back to her family that did have some means. They gathered up their resources. They hired a lawyer, and the case was dismissed. That is an example that's constantly being played out. Because in Alabama, 98% of the convictions in a given year are because of pleas. Um, second, I mean, I can tell you that when, when we look at the, you know, the overarching, you know, problems, it is truly, you, again, where the court must step in. We had a judge, having started my career as a limited jurisdiction judge, that, that scene, I told Brian, oh my goodness, how it brought back memories of just the amazing masses of people that would come in, so many of them poor. So many of them were drug and alcohol issues that would come in, and I would quite deliberately go through all their rights, et cetera, et cetera. But we had a judge that a Judicial Inquiry Commission uh, petition uh, that he had violated the canons was finally, and I mean finally, filed against him because he gave a Iraq veteran, a woman who had PTSD, 10 days in jail for a speeding ticket because she had the audacity to plead guilty. He is no longer on the bench. Everyone in the courtroom, everyone in the courthouse came to her as she was literally going into complete, uh, you know, apoplexy, said, oh, it's okay, this is just what he does to discourage pleas. This is just what the judge does to discourage pleas. It's going to be okay. We, you know, we'll get you out. The assistant district attorney comes over to comfort the woman. He no longer is on the bench. But there is no way to quantify the thousands of people charged with misdemeanors that their rights were trampled upon. Mr. Leahy, do, do the public defenders you supervise have the time to even know the people they're representing? What are their caseloads case like in, in your state and elsewhere? And what about this whole issue of small town versus big town? Well, um, first, your question allows me to say something I wanted to say anyway. Um, and that is that we have in this room 
um, almost every person in this room uh, is a person who has dedicated a significant part of his or her life to the pursuit of equal justice. Uh, and I have to say that a lot of my experience at the level of overseeing representation has been overseeing very competent, very effective representation by very dedicated lawyers. Uh, and my small role in that over most of the last uh, two decades plus uh, has been to try to obtain for those good, dedicated lawyers the resources that they need and to set the standards at a level uh, where uh, if you don't have those, if you don't have that level of dedication, you'll be encouraged to apply it. Um, all that said, uh, in, in a relatively, I suppose, positive vein, um, I have a deep pessimism uh, about the state of Gideon at half century. Um, and I hope that one of the things we can talk about on this panel are some of the systemic reasons for that. And my own two favorite ones I want to start are the, the basic, fundamental, unfunded federal mandate upon each of the 50 states. Um, and the second thing is the dramatic trend, as you have indicated, Nina, in your re by, by your reading, uh, in ever broadening the contours of the criminal law and ever expanding the scope of punishment. Uh, those issues account for that sevenfold increase in incarceration in, that the United States has seen in the last 50 years, and they also seriously drive up the already heavy burden on the states and the localities. Uh, and those are two uh, uh, really multi-decade sea changes that must be reversed if Gideon is to have a more successful second half century. Um, Brian, you usually t get these cases on appeal when people are already serving terms. Um, do you think a substantial number of them are innocent? I know this is inimical to a lot of people in the room. Are innocent or just poorly represented? Well, I think the innocent are frequently poorly represented, and so the two things go hand in hand. Um, but I do think that that is the challenge. We can't tell whether someone is innocent or not uh, if they have not been well defended. If there's a defense out there that required an investigation, required some time, and you don't see it in the record, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And I think one of the great challenges we have is actually reviving this conversation about what a right to counsel means. Uh, you know, I, I, I think about Gideon, and I think about the other decisions that came from the court during this time period. In 1955, the United States Supreme Court in Brown versus Board of Education said no more racial segregation in education. And there was a very dramatic, very visible uh, movement to resist that decision. Uh, the Supreme Court in 1963 says you now have to provide a right to counsel. There was a very dramatic, not so visible resistance to that decision. And that legacy has carried on, uh, unchallenged by the kind of movement, the kind of activism, the kind of inquiry that the civil rights movement inspired. And so as a result of that, we still have dozens of states that have never created defender systems, have never actually invested in any kind of quality control for defense systems. And that means day in and day out, these problems persist. And one of the challenges that I think we face as we now look 50 years back, uh, what does the right mean if there is no remedy for violation of that right? And we haven't really created an effective way to get to that. And that's one of the reasons why I think we have to talk about effective uh, representation, effective right to counsel. Well, that, 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 that leads me to the, fo the obvious follow-up question for all of you is, uh, in Brown versus the Board, we had all deliberate speed until the court just abandoned it and said it isn't working. The United States Supreme Court has never adopted any specific standards of what is effective representation. It hasn't said that the ABA standards have to be met at some level. Uh, not even, you know, not even eight out of ten. Pick your eight. <laughs> you know, it just, just it, there is no, there is no definition of what's effective counsel. Uh, so until there is that, what's in it for states if they don't, if they don't live up to the, the idea, the the idea and the ideal of Gideon? Yeah, I think there have to be consequences, and I appreciate the vice president's comment about the court playing a role. This is an area where the right is got to be enforced, and it's a right on behalf of people who are disfavored, disadvantaged, poor, marginalized, hated. They're the people we fear. They're the people we're angry at. So the court has to protect them. 
and it has to protect them in ways of, I think, advancing this. The court in 1983 said in Strickland, uh, we want there to be deficient performance that's unreasonable and observable, and we want there to be prejudice. A lot of the things we see in these cases, I think, actually shouldn't be subject to the kind of prejudice analysis that we're talking about here. To me, it's presumptively prejudicial to have a lawyer drunk in court, sleeping in court, uh, unprepared, untrained, who doesn't meet the client until right before the plea. That, to me, is presumptively prejudicial lawyering, and I think courts should stop it, and only courts will stop it. Legislatures won't. Policymakers won't. Courts have to say it's not ever effective to meet your client and two minutes later plead them guilty, to meet your client and not do an investigation, to not come to the process with some resources that you're going to then direct. It's that kind of uh, reinforcement of this right that I think we have to do. I would agree with that, uh, and uh, I note that in the, uh, the plea bargaining cases from, uh, from last term, uh, that attention was paid to the standards, and I think that's a hopeful sign. Uh, and uh, I'd like to make a another way of looking at this for me historically. Uh, for a quarter century, from 1938, uh, when the Supreme Court in Johnston, Johnson versus Zerbst declared the right to counsel in federal court until 1963, Gideon, there was a two-tier system where a federal defendant had the constitutional right, the Sixth Amendment right, and all state defendants lacked it in felony cases. Well, now everybody has the same right, but the 5% of the defendants who come into federal court have a generally much higher expectation that their lawyer will either be a salaried defender with a reasonable caseload and a decent salary, or a private defender of some experience and a decent hourly rate and then there's the other 95 percent. So that's another more systemic way of looking at it, perhaps an equal justice violation, certainly in a political sense, if not in a strictly legal sense, uh, that I think uh, is, needs to be addressed. But Chief Justice Cobb, you're the only person on this panel who's actually run for office. And to, uh, these are, this is taxpayers' money you're talking about. A and all state and local governments, Without exception, I think, with maybe the exception of North Dakota where they're fracking, uh, they all have enormous gaps in what they can spend at the moment. Everybody's trying to cut, not add burden. So what, you know, as a person who actually knows what it's like running for elective office, how do, you, how do we get this done? As someone who's, I've run five times, and statewide I've run three times, having served on the Court of Criminal Appeals, where I ruled on 25,000 criminal cases, I can tell you, as the Vice President said, you don't win kudos for using your political capital for indigent criminal defendants. That's why I really agree with the Vice President. I think the court has got to step in, up in a meaningful way. And the reason is, when that lawyer is intoxicated, his defendant uh, his client, and surely not the DA on the other side, doesn't say, excuse me, Your Honor, would you place, we'd like to mention for the record that a, uh, defense counsel's intoxicated. Excuse me, Your Honor, we'd like to put it on the record that my lawyer is sleeping. It's not on the record. And so that's where something more per se uh, has really got to happen. Now that doesn't mean that all of us in this room and our numbers multiplied by thousands should not be more vocal and speak up on these issues. Because I really do think because of the shows that you mentioned, the public, this is one of those legal issues that the public actually does understand because they're watching CSI. They're watching, you know, all the various programs. And so when I tell people in Alabama, I've got this wonderful privilege to come and talk about Gideon, you know, that's the case that, you know, laid, paved the way for indigents to have legal counsel and, you know, Miranda and everything that flowed out of it. And they go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They do get it. but. We've got to, I really believe, get the district attorneys and prosecutors on our side, and it's going to take significant, you know, uh, leverage to do that. Can I just say, yeah. I mean, one of the challenges that I think this is another area for the courts to play a greater role is that uh, since Gideon's time, there's been a tremendous emergence of what I would call proceduralism. Uh, Justice Kaven mentioned that, uh, that the difficulty is by the time the court cases get to the courts, I think one of the ways we can incentivize better advocacy is to disincentivize uh, insulating bad advocacy. Uh, you know, the procedures were created to actually promote finality and fairness. And what they've done instead is insulate bad lawyering and unfairness. 
And I think that's something that courts have to take on. I don't think there should be a requirement for contemporaneous objection or even preserving issues when we know there are structural barriers to adequate representation. I think we have to actually reduce some of these procedural barriers uh, if we're not going to provide full representation. Today, Gideon's petition could not be granted by the United States Supreme Court. He didn't say the things he needed to say in the courtroom. He didn't do the things he needed to do on appeal. And that ought to challenge us to look at the ways in which we have, through our commitment to proceduralism, shielded ourselves from actually engaging in the kind of conversation we need to have on how we make the right to counsel meaningful. So to explain that to people who may, may watch this at some point and not be proceduralists, can, can you folks explain in the, in the ideal world how you would do that? Because after all, the two people who are defense lawyers here don't go to the Supreme Court or any lower court and say, oh, don't worry about my, my client's procedural rights. They're, they're, that's one of the ways that, that they help their clients. One of my suggestions would be, uh, when you look at the, the body of law revolving around Batson, uh, and you saw that systemic, historic discrimination on prosecutors for selecting their jury, you looked at the historic history of the DA, correct, Brian? You know, have you systemically, continually, what is your pattern and practice? Well, in Alabama, we have contract counsel that will have uh, way more cases, of course, than what they should have or what's recommended. And not one of the ca those cases where they have defended, they would have taken to trial. So at some point, it would look like their history of never, ever taking a, a client to trial ought to speak volumes about whether or not they are aggressively um, representing their client. Because, you know, I really believe, and I think most of the people in this room believe, people don't deserve just to be represented they actually deserved to be defended. And that's what Gideon was all about. Yes, Bill? I have two specific uh, proposals to make. Uh, one is that for about 40 of the 50 years of Gideon's history, the American Bar Association has proposed that there be a national uh, committee for indigent defense services to set the standards, assist the states, act as a national leader. No state that has made any significant progress in implementing Gideon has done so without a strong agency and a strong leader. And yet nationally we're trying to do it not only with very little to no federal money, but we're doing it with the leadership coming entirely and recently from the Department of Justice. And I join everyone else in lauding what Eric and his staff are doing. But there needs to be the agency that it's the need for it is self-evident, um, and it's just been reiterated by the ABA just a month ago, um, and it's time to get it done. Um, the second thing, and assuming because that requires political action, it might not happen in the next uh, 60 days or so, um, is that I would encourage uh, uh, Attorney General Holder and his staff to convene what uh, David Carroll at the Sixth Amendment Center has called a National Commission on the Fair Administration of Justice to bring in the judges, the prosecutors, uh, the victims' advocates, the defendants' advocates, the defenders, and not only figure out how we can get the funding and the support that's necessary and that we all acknowledge, but also how we can scale back some of the reach of the criminal law and the punishment schemes so that the costs and the costs both fiscal and human can be brought back into something approaching um, let's say a mid-range of the global standard instead of the United States standing up there by far as number one as the most incarceration hap uh, happy nation on the planet. I mean, it's, it's the over-dependence on incarceration. Uh, when 5% when of the world's population locks up 25% of the world's population, I mean, something needs to be done. Alabama has the most overcrowded prison system in the United States of America at approaching 200% of capacity. And a significant portion of those people are there because of ineffective representation of counsel. I just took my, took my law class um, on a tour of Draper, Brian. And... Um, Draper Prison is at 230% of capacity. Please write that down, everybody in the Justice Department. 230% of capacity. 
Uh, the chapel only holds 115 people and there are 1,255 people in the institution. And when I, we followed up, the, the warden led the tour, which she's so kind to do, and I got to the end and said, Warden, what would you like to say to these aspiring young lawyers? These, these are third-year students that are about to be lawyers. Do you know what he said? Go and do your job. Because there are people here in this prison who do not deserve to be here. You know, in some ways, we're all preaching to the converted here. Uh, you know, it's, it's widely considered, for example, to be a very um, inappropriate thing to simply assign counsel uh, to defend people because they're really not equipped to do it. They're not, they don't have any specific training in the criminal law. But of course, they've never been in a criminal courtroom. They've never been in a jail. They've never seen what it's like to be at an arraignment. And maybe if you could actually enlist the bar that way, you could get people to do something as opposed to having very nice conferences like this where we all agree. Well, there, I think there are several things that you can do that actually will get close to that. I, I mean, we could uh, just adopt. I mean, if the Justice Department says all the states should adopt the ABA standards of representation as a matter of first principle and then relates to those states differently if they haven't adopted it, I think that makes a huge difference. If courts, every court in America gets hundreds if not thousands of cases where allegations of ineffective assistance of counsel has been presented. It's a very, very big issue because it's a very big problem. If we start talking about uh, what the system requires, if we start talking about standards like the ABA standards, if we start actually holding counties and courthouses accountable when they tolerate structural problems, we begin to, to, to turn the conversation around. And then you do bring in other people. Uh, you know, civil lawyers have actually done a fantastic job in criminal cases in the pro bono area. There are no barriers that can keep you from being effective. However, there are skills involved. And we have to have the kind of training, the kind of resources. You can take a great lawyer, and we've seen this in defender programs all over this country, and give them so many cases uh, that we make them ineffective. Everybody can be made ineffective if we pack the caseload up to the point where you can't even meet your client. And that happens every day in this country. So in all this gloom and doom, are there any rays of light? Dim silence. Yeah. No, I, I'd, I'd like to jump in there. Um, the, the, the rays of light are really, um, to go back to something I said at the outset, they're, they're in every program. Um, you know, I operate in New York State now, which does not have the kind of uh, support statewide that, that, that I was accustomed to in Massachusetts. There are lots and lots of lawyers, not just you know, veterans of the 60s, but new lawyers with a lot of enthusiasm. Um, and the challenge, Brian really said it perfectly, the challenge is to see that they can operate in a system that allows them the time and the support. The time because that's what good lawyering takes, and the support because the system pushes back at you. A lot of the judge, some of the judges, some of the prosecutors, they, they push back pretty hard if, if they're sensing that you're, you're advocating strenuously for your clients. So you have to have support from your, from your institution. Um, and uh, I think that uh, uh, that requires a recommitment. It requires um, uh, the push, you know, and that's why I want that national person in charge because the country, this country needs a prophet now. We've had a Gideon, now we need a prophet. We need a truth teller. And we need that person here in Washington. I hope it's gonna be Brian, but, you know. <laughs> so, Chief Justice Cobb, you have been very instrumental in, in enacting some reforms in Alabama. Which ones have been successful? Which ones have worked? The one that we're most proud of is um, we, I made for the court system the passage of the Juvenile Justice Reform Act of 2008, our uh, major priority, and we were able to pass that in two years. And as a result of that, plus the education of our judges, the training, um, help um, uh, from Casey Family Initiatives, um, we were able to reduce the number of children in detention in Alabama by 55 percent, have maintained that now for four years, and have reduced the number of children in Department of Youth Services by 50 percent. And juvenile crime did what? Went down. So we're very excited about that, and that, act, that Juvenile Justice Reform Act um, 
it got bipartisan support because we made it we made it a priority. The other thing is that it also enhanced the right to counsel of children. Uh, gave them the, really the right to not just have a best interest lawyer or guardian ad litem, but also a client directed lawyer, and really questions the right that whether whether or not a, a juvenile can actually wa waive um, that right. I, I think I just want to join what Bill said. Or I think this is an area where the, the encouraging thing is that there's there are new leaders, and I think what the attorney general is doing here today having a member of the court here, having the people in this room here. We just need the leaders, though, to say more, and we need them to do more. Uh, you know, there are a lot of prosecutors in this room. I think, I agree with uh, Chief Justice Cobb, a prosecutor could actually be a huge force uh, in joining motions for uh, more resources for the lawyer who needs those experts, uh, joining motions uh, to challenge some of the judgments being made, you know, even on the federal side. Now, there are real questions about whether the appointing authority should reside in the judge. And there are times when that appointing authority is well managed, uh, but there are times when it's abused. And having even, you know, uh, federal judges or state court judges uh, picking lawyers that don't actually serve the interests of the client, but serve the efficiency of the court's docket is something that ought to concern not just defendants, but also prosecutors and people committed to just operation. And so there's a lot of things we can all do by being more vocal, I mean, if the goal of the system is to do justice, then when you see injustice, which I think everybody in this courtroom, in this room sees all the time, we have to become much more vocal about it. And in the Justice Department, when they are giving grants to our district attorneys, what if they ask additional questions? Like, exactly what are you doing as far as the, the providing an open file rule? Why wouldn't they want to give an open file rule? If they really want justice, they ought to say, here, have it all. I want you to see everything we've got against you. There's other questions, you know, that they could be asked about what kind of leadership they're giving us on these issues. And if their answer is um, no or I don't know, maybe they don't deserve that grant. Okay. With that, I'm going to let the Chief Justice have the last word. Thank you so much for being here and for being the, the tough nuts that we're all glad you are. <laughs> Well, thank you, Nia, and special thanks to each of today's panelists for their uh, contributions to what I think is an extremely important discussion. I want to thank you for taking your time to share your insights and your experiences with us. Uh, a video of today's event, along with information on the Justice Department's tools and, and resources for supporting indigent defense systems, will soon be available on our new Gideon website, which can be accessed by visiting the web address that you see right there on the screen. I'd also like to thank Tony West and Deborah Leff, as well as the entire Access to Justice, Justice staff for their leadership, for their tireless efforts in helping to realize the promise of Gideon for everyone in this country. Uh, I think we can all agree that despite the progress that's been made over the last 50 years, it's pretty clear that our work is, uh, is far from over. Significant challenges still lie ahead, and major obstacles have yet to be overcome. But as we are reminded today, if a simple handwritten petition can help to transform America's legal system, then I believe that there's no limit to what all of us working together can achieve. So as we leave here this afternoon, I would ask that you join me in renewing our collective commitment to building on these efforts long into the future. And I urge you to honor the legacy of this truly extraordinary case by serving as sound stewards of our nation's justice system and servants of all those it protects and empowers, particularly the most vulnerable members of our society. I want to thank you all once again for joining us. This concludes today's uh, commemoration ceremony. Thank you all very much. Thank you.